Well, hey, good evening, everybody. All of you that call Rock Creek your church home and those of you watching from a distance, welcome to this week's version of Wednesday Night Live. Uh, Don't forget, we continue to move towards a subscribable podcast that'll be a video cast called Go the Distance. Continue to uh, be patient with us as we work towards that in the weeks to come, but you can always catch us on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, Rock Creek Church. Subscribe to that or on Facebook here on Wednesday nights at 7. So we thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to get back this week into teaching. The last few weeks I've done some interviews with some uh, friends of mine and those in ministry and obviously uh, talking about the culture and the climate of the culture today and some things that uh, have been going on around us. Um, Last week, you guys remember, I interviewed my best friend, Josh Baird, who was our camp speaker for our student camp this past week. We had an amazing camp. We had eight young people give their life to Christ as a result of camp and of the messages they heard from the Word of God. So we're thanking and praising God for that. And for those of you that have been praying for my friend Josh, thank you for doing that. He is home. He has officially left Texas and doing well. And he's got a journey ahead of him. And so I pray that you would continue to Encourage him when you can through social media, but pray for his health and the days and the journey ahead of him. I'm going to jump back in this week on our on our episode of Wednesday Night Live back into the book that I've been reading called How to Worship a King. And it's a slow read, and I don't read fast anyway because I don't retain a lot when I read fast. I, I retain better when I read slow or go back and reread. And so... I've just been walking through this book slowly and I've been sharing with you some of the things that I've been learning and God's been teaching me through this book as well as it parallels with scripture and the scripture that's put into this book. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about how to kiss a king. That's the chapter that I just recently read, how to kiss a king. And that's kind of a crazy title to a chapter and it's kind of weird, but um, as we unpack this tonight, you're going to find that that's exactly what we do when we worship our King Jesus. The Greek word most often translated for the word worship is a word called proskuneo. P-R-O-S-K-U-N-E-O, proskuneo. And the word proskuneo has several meanings. The first meaning is to prostrate yourself before God, laying flat on one's face before the Lord. And those of you that A couple years ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, heard Pastor Josh preach back when we were still at Navo Middle School. He also talked to us about the Greek word patak, which means to lay prostrate before the Lord, and he challenged us to do that. But there are two other meanings to the word proskuneo. There are two other applications. The second one is this. It's this idea of adoration. Um, So it's to adore. So when we worship, when we worship God, or whatever we worship in our lives, we are showing adoration towards that. But there's a third meaning to this word proskuneo. And this meaning, um, it elicits some debate. There's some some debate over this meaning and actually what it means to do this. And it it, it means basically to, to take our hands and kiss or blow a kiss forward to someone. So, so proskuneo in regards to worship would be doing this to God when we worship, blowing God a kiss. Now, for American men in particular, um, it's kind of an unpopular or uncomfortable thought that when we worship, we're blowing God a kiss because it kind of relates to this idea of a public display of affection. And a lot of men are uncomfortable with public displays of affection. But we serve a God who is open and public with his display of affection for us. And so in turn, he expects us, men and women, to be comfortable with public displays of adoration or love or worship for him. It literally means this idea that we're blowing kisses to God as we worship God. Watch this from a distance. Now, we know everything there is about relational distancing right now, do we not? I mean, in every relationship we have, we've been social distancing, and I hate that term, um, but it is what it is. We have to social distance, but relationally, we're not distanced. So with God, there's a distance between us, 
but the distance between our hearts and the heart of God are close. So in a lot of ways, that's why we blow kisses in worship to God, because God is a little farther away than we wish we were. It's kind of like dads, when you used to pull away from the house, or maybe you currently do, and your kids would wave bye to you, your little kids, as you would go to work, and they might blow a kiss to you. It's because they're not with you in the car. They physically cannot touch you, but they can show adoration to you and towards you by blowing you a kiss. Now, this is in the New Testament, this idea of kissing Jesus or worshiping him with a kiss. And it's contained in Luke chapter 7. And it's the, uh, it's the scene where Jesus is anointed by a sinful woman. And she anoints him with a very expensive perfume. But she also does something very unique in her moment of worshiping Jesus. Verse 36 of Luke 7 says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. That's a lot of tears. Tears that are following from her eyes, her face, and landing on the feet of Jesus. It says, then she wiped them, these tears, with her hair and kissed them, his feet, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, Is this man, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now drop down to verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, he being Jesus, Do you see this woman? He's speaking with Simon. I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. What is the point here? What is the moment? This lady, full of sin, living in a sinful life, comes into the presence of Jesus and worships him. She she wets his feet with her tears. She wipes them with her hair. She constantly is kissing his feet and she pours the perfume in her alabaster box on his feet. The Pharisee sees this and is is upset and angry for her public and what he feels is an inappropriate display of affection to which Jesus condemns and chastises the Pharisee for his lack of love and awareness that the king was in his presence. Jesus recognizes the woman's behavior, including the kisses on his feet, as an expression of love. And just like a kiss, worship is an expression of intimate love for God. The more intimate the relationship, the more passionate the expression of our affection. Now think about this for a minute. I have people in my life that I give kisses to. And all these people that I give kisses to, those kisses are different. For instance, my best friend that was on with me last week, Josh Barrett, after his episode of his health scare this past week, I gave him a kiss when he left on the cheek. It was a kiss of brotherly love. It was a kiss that said, I love you not just as a friend, but I love you as my brother. Then there's another kiss that I give a lot, and that's a kiss right now that I give to my baby niece, Scarlett. And I love that little baby. That little baby has my heart, and she already has me wrapped around her little finger. 
She is so precious. And when she's in my presence and I'm in her presence, I'm constantly kissing her on top of her head and on her forehead. I love to kiss her because I adore her as my niece. But then there's my favorite person to kiss, and that's my precious, gorgeous, beautiful wife, Sarah. And this type of kiss that I give her is hers alone. It is reserved specifically for her. It is completely different from the kiss that I give Josh, thank God, and it's completely different from the kisses that I give little Scarlet on her forehead. The kisses that I give to Sarah are the most intimate, they're the most precious, they're the most passionate, because my intimate love for her is greater than my love for Scarlet or Josh. You see, greater, the greater the intimacy in our relationship, the more passionate the worship or the kiss should be. After all, think about it for a minute. We're worshiping a king who defined his passion for us, his desire for intimacy with us in a relationship by stretching his arms wide on a cross. As a matter of fact, the whole crucifixion of Jesus is called the passion of the Christ. You see, we, we do not have a reserved, stoic God that somewhere far, far away in this universe, some cosmic crud that cares nothing for us. That's not our God. We have an extravagant, passionate, loving God that is demonstrating his love for us on a cross. It's extravagant. It's passionate. It's intimate. It's demonstrative. We've been trained by our God, our King, how to worship God, how He expects us, us to intimately love Him. But at the same time, we've been trained by a world that is fallen, that is emotionally crippled as a culture. And it's time that we move away from cultures, cultures uh, teaching and cultures uh, emotional training of us in how to worship the God that loves us so much. And the only way that we can learn how to love a God with extravagant love the way he loved us is to sit at the feet of Jesus. My wife and I, we have a public and we have a private kiss. There's a difference between the public kiss and the private kiss. And worship is the same. My most deepest affectionate moments with God are in my personal quiet time. Sunday morning, the public display of that worship and that love is just icing on the cake from the intimate love relationship that I've been with him, in with him all week long. Leaders, pastors, people in the church, we have to be careful how we judge other people's worship. So many times I've heard people judge others' worship by saying, that's inappropriate, that's too much, that's over the top. Listen, the Pharisee said the same thing about the woman in Luke 7, that her behavior was inappropriate. He judged her behavior thinking it was too far outside the box that she had crossed a line. And Jesus said, listen, it's not inappropriate what she has done. What she has done, has it has been an act of worship showing great love for me. And listen to me, how much more inappropriate can you get than a king hanging naked and bleeding on a cross. Yet love calls for such a measure. So be careful. Let's be careful of what we approve of and let's be careful of what we condemn. Because true worship is always a demonstration of love for God. When it is motivated by anything else, by, by, by pride, by religion or whatever, it is self-worship and it is idolatry. Listen, I have enough to worry about at my house. I have enough to worry about in the house of my life than to be worried about everybody else's worship. But I encourage you to worship God intimately in private and in public. And don't worry about what anybody else around you is saying or doing because he is your king and he is my king and he deserves our worship. He's a, he's a father who loves us and in turn, he's a father who we love. 
because he's a good, good father. And, and I think about the love of a father and I think about how far that fatherly love goes. And I was, I, I was thinking about a lot of our young guys in our church, young, our young fathers. You see, when I was raising Haley, back in the, the mid and, and uh, mid 90s and early 2000s um, they didn't have these daddy daughter dance things um, we just didn't do those things they weren't a part of culture that is something that has recently become very popular but I know like our staff guys and a lot of guys in our church that have gone to daddy daughter dances with their daughters and most of those guys they don't know how to dance. They, they're, they're awkward on the dance floor. And, and it's like, I really don't want to go to this, but you go to it, not because it's something you want to go to. You go to it because you love your daughter and you're willing to sacrifice and be extravagant in your love towards her as a father. Think about this for a minute in relation to that illustration. Jesus doesn't come to church because he loves church. Jesus comes to church because you're there and he loves you. Jesus doesn't show up in your prayer closet because he loves prayer. He shows up because he loves you and he loves it when you pray. Jesus didn't go to the cross because Jesus loves the cross. Jesus went to the cross because he loves you and he was winning your love by hanging on the cross. Why do we go to church? And you know what? We're in an awkward season right now because a lot of people still haven't come back to church. A lot of people are taking church in online. And one of the reasons why I so desire to get our building back open and get back together as a congregation is because I love going to church because I love being in the presence of not only each other, but in the presence of God. And, and I love the worship music and I love the message and I love everything that comes with it. But I don't go because I love all of those things. I go because I love Jesus. And those are, are all those things are a result of my love for Jesus. Why do you pray? Why do you study God's Word? You see, studying God's Word changes. Your whole perspective of reading the Bible changes when you read it from this perspective of, I'm not reading the Bible just to read the Bible or get some brownie points with God. I'm reading the Bible because I love my Savior and I want to know more about my God. How valuable, how valuable is it, parents? How valuable is it that our children receive hugs and kisses from us. It's not enough for a child to be told, you know I love you because I provide for you. Or does that unwillingness to show affection leave a hole in a child's heart later on in their life when they become adults? Think about what woman would want to be married to a man who never demonstrated his love for her, who never held her hand or spoke to her kindly, who never remembered her birthday or your wedding anniversary. What, what woman would be intimately in love with a man who never initiates a touch or a kiss or a cuddle? Would any rational woman choose a man like that from the very beginning of a relationship? How many men would choose a woman to be married to to spend his life with that's embarrassed to be seen with him or repulsed by the thought of his touch and no desire for him? How many would marry a cold fish, a passionless, loveless disinterested woman. Does any man want to marry a bride like that? I don't think so. And I have news for you, neither does Jesus. The church is called the bride of Christ. And Christ did not die for a lifeless, passionless, loveless, disinterested bride. Because he put his passion on display to win the heart of his bride. We in turn must put our passion on the altar of worship for him. As the saying goes, words are cheap. All love worth receiving is worth, or love worth demonstrating. Let me say that again. All love worth receiving is love worth demonstrating. And God thought so. So he demonstrated his love for us on a cross. God didn't tell us he loved us. He showed us he loved us. You understand that if God can demonstrate his love for us, we in turn can demonstrate our love for him. And it's more than just lip service. Let me, let me take it a little bit further. In this idea of communication, 
communicating with each other or with God. 55% of all communication is body language. Actions actually do speak louder than words. So worship is love expressed to God, but it's done so not just by verbally saying it, but it's done by body language. It's done by activity to, to and towards God. There's a book many years ago that was written. It's been used a lot in, in, um, in marriage counseling and even in, in premarital counseling. It's a book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. And many of you are probably recognize that. And there's, the thesis is this. We all tend to express and receive love in one of five different ways or in a combination of these five ways. The love languages are words of affirmation. We say nice things. Quality time, receiving and giving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. God speaks all five of those love languages. Words of affirmation. Christians would call that praise. Quality time. We would call that a quiet time and a prayer time and reading God's word. Receiving gifts. That's, that's when we give tithes and offerings. God loves it when we give to him. The language of acts of service speaks for itself. That's when we serve God and in, in the church and outside the church. And physical touch. We have a God who still wants to touch, comfort, heal, and be near his people. He wants us to experience him now in our physical bodies, not just somewhere in the there and then in our glorified bodies. God wants to demonstrate his love physically to us through a touch. And he receives love when we demonstrate it physically as well. So how do we do that? How do we physically show love to a God that we physically can't touch? Well, I'm glad you asked because there's some scripture in John chapter 14 that gives us that clue to how that can take place. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The key word there is keep. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Again, the key word is keeps. John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. The key word is obey. Keeps, obey. John 14, 24 says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Worship is love expressed God's way. And God's love language are all five of those love languages, but they're all wrapped up and encapsulated in one word, obedience. Everything else that we do for God, if it is not founded and it is not grounded in obedience, it is vanity in its futility. God cannot be fooled. Now listen to me. We have way too many Christians that are like Texans. They wear big hats, but they have no cattle. They say big amens and raise big hands on Sunday morning, but don't obey the commands of God, the entirety of those commands in their life daily. God knows our heart. There's an old saying that a friend of mine says, you can't play poker, poker with God. You can't fool God. You can't play poker with him because he knows what's in your hand. So while you can fool everyone around you, you can't fool God. God knows your heart. But listen, obedience is not about religion. Obedience is not about works. I'm not talking about doing something or obeying, obeying God to win or earn salvation. Obeying God is how we demonstrate affection for God. It's how we physically touch God in worship and in adoration and in love. It's how we blow our kisses to God is through obeying God. Salvation demonstrated God's love for us. And worship through obedience demonstrates our love for God. 
Obedience is the ingredient that keeps worship from becoming escapism. This is obedience, let me say that. This is so good. Obedience is the ingredient that keeps worship from being nothing more than an emotionally driven moment. Richard Foster says it this way, as worship begins in holy expectancy, it ends in holy obedience. Holy obedience saves worship from becoming an escape from the pressing needs of modern life. Worship is the intersection of love and lordship. Man, that's good. Somebody needs to write that down. Worship is the intersection of love and lordship. So let me just say it to you this way. If you're worshiping God because you love him, but he's not Lord over every area of your life, then you're missing what God has for you. You're missing the moment that God wants to be with you. I'm not saying this because I want to judge anybody because I have enough to worry about in my own life. I have to look to myself. You have to look to yourself. But true, genuine, heart-led, heartfelt, loving worshipers ultimately worship with a spirit that is submitted completely to the Lordship of Christ in every area of your life. So as I wrap up tonight, as we conclude, I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. How, how willing are you to get undignified in your worship? How willing are you to worship outside the box? How willing are you to stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you and your worship and worship God unapologetically without any restrictions, with the same passionate love that God showed to you through His Son, Jesus, on a cross. And as a result of that worship, are you willing to show God your love for Him by speaking all five of the love languages to Him through your obedience to Him and His Word? Not just in a quarter of your life or half your life, but in every area of your life. I, I certainly think we live in a time and we live in a culture where the big hat, no cattle days are gone. The world has been fooled way too long by those of us that claim to be followers of Jesus. We have to be on Monday through Saturday what our worship was on Sunday morning. They have to match. We have to not just blow kisses to God on Sunday and then never ever ever have a conversation with him until the following Sunday. God wants so much more for you. God wants so much more for me. But it's not just that he wants it, he deserves it. We are his bride. We are his church. And in relation to a father and a daughter or a father and a son or even a marital relationship with the bride of Christ being us and him being the bridegroom, what kind of relationship would that those be physically and spiritually if there was never any expression of love, if there was never ever a physical touch, if it was just, I told you I loved you when you were born, I told you I loved you when I married you, and if I ever stop, I'll tell you. What kind of relationship would that be? Our God loved us so passionately. He loved us so unapologetically. He loved us to the extreme. In turn, He deserves a bride who will love Him to that extreme as well. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I've enjoyed bringing you this lesson as I continue to read through this book and through, through God's Word in my quiet times in the morning. Uh, God is speaking to me. I, I, I can tell you straight up, most of the best sermon material I get is in my quiet times that God speaks to me. And so, super, super excited to continue to press forward in the summer months here as we head towards fall. And I just continue to pray for each and every one of you. I continue to... Um, Look forward to the day where every one of us can be back together on Sundays, worshiping together, not scattered or abroad or, or doing the remote worship online. I, I, I know all of you look forward to being back together. So let's pray. Let's pray together as we end tonight. Let's pray that God would heal our land, that God would uh, rid us of this COVID-19 issue, that we could get back to being together. Let's pray that God would continue to heal and mend our, our culture and our 
our, our citizens of America, that we would continue to move towards uh, justice in every area of our life and that God would just be on the throne of every life in our, in our country and that he would be honored and glorified in our lives as we live it out. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in our imperfections, you still love us, that in spite of us, you still love us. And you loved us so much that you showed that passion on a cross some 2,000 years ago, that you demonstrated how much you loved us by holding nothing back from us. And so in turn, God, when it comes to worshiping you, when it comes to worshiping our King, we pray that you would give us the ability, the freedom to hold nothing back when it comes to our love for you. You deserve our extravagant love and worship. You deserve the kisses being blown to you every day from a distance from your children, from your bride. Lord, we don't want to just have a moment where we receive an eternal destiny in heaven and never have a daily relationship with you. So today we stop and we adore you. We bow before you and we blow you a kiss. We say we love you, God. We worship you. Thank you. Lord, we pray that you would heal our land. We pray that we would get healthy in this country, that this country be rid, this world would be rid of the COVID-19 virus, that we could get back to being together, all of us, in your house, worshiping you soon. Lord, we pray for social justice and we pray for justice for those who have broken laws and Lord, we pray that you would be with the divide in our country, politically, racially. We pray that you would heal where healing needs to take place. We pray that we would be the bomb. We would be the, the ointment as, as the church that soothes and salves the wound that runs deep. Not just in this country, but in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods. Lord, use us to be the change agent. Lord, I thank you for the hope that we saw this past week that the future generation, there's some great young people that love you and want to do something great for you. Lord, continue to work in their lives. Lord, be with our church during this season. Sustain us, God, during this season, this, this unique time that no church has ever really ever had to face like this. So sustain us, God. Take care of us. We're your people. This is your church, and we love you, and we thank you so much, God, for your son, Jesus. And it's in his holy name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, God bless you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Don't forget, we'll be back for worship 9, 10, 30, and noon this Sunday in our facility. And if you're joining us on our online campus, that'll be the 10, 30 a.m. service. And we're going to have a great Sunday prepared for you. Can't wait to see you. God bless you, and good night.